Hello and thanks for watching. In today's video, I'm going to explain the exact process that takes place before you have an EV charge point fitted at your property. If you stick around till later on in the video as well, I'll also be going through some other things like the types of connectors, pen protection, RCD protection, and other issues related to EV charge points. My name's Gary from ABC Electric. Let's get straight into it. Now, before I get into it, I'm going to explain what the DNO is. The DNO is the distribution network operator. They supply the cables and the infrastructure to get the electricity to your property. They are not the people that you pay the bill to. When you contact me with an inquiry about having an EV charge point fitted at your property, the first thing that I will do will be to contact you or arrange an appointment with you to do what's known as a pre-installation survey. The pre-installation survey is to assess the suitability of the electricity supply at your property prior to the day of installation. I'll also be looking at other parts of the electrics at your property to check that they are suitable for the installation of an EV charge point. So let's look at these items more closely and break them down one at a time. The first thing that I'll be looking at is the DNO's intake equipment, commonly known as the service head. This comprises the incoming cable, the cutout or fuse, and the connections to the electrics at the rest of your property. I'll be assessing the type of supply at your property, which is normally either TNS or TNCS. I'll be seeing if I can establish the fuse rating. I'll be looking to see what condition the intake equipment is in. And most importantly, I'll be looking to see if you're on what's known as a looped supply. A looped supply is normally not good news because that means that you and one or more other properties are sharing the same supply cable from the road, in which case this will have to be upgraded. The next thing that I will be assessing is the earthing and bonding arrangements at your property. The main earth comes from the supplier, generally, and it's very important that this is around 16 millimeters squared. Then I'll also be looking at the equipotential bonding, which connects any metal service pipes together, such as gas and water, if they come in in metal, and this conductor should be 10 millimeters squared. Now, not every property has equipotential bonding, because if your gas and water come in from the road in yellow and blue in those orders uh, of plastic or MDPE, then you don't need equipotential bonding. I'll also be looking at the size of the main cables that go from the DNO's cutout to your electricity meter and from there to your consumer unit. These are normally called tails and should be around 25 millimeters squared. Sometimes if they're 16 millimeters squared, they may need to be upgraded. Next, I'll look at your consumer unit inside the property to see if there's a spare way that we can connect the EV charger to. I'll also be checking whether you have the correct type of RCD fitted in that unit, which is a type A. Now, if you don't have a spare way or you don't have a type A RCD fitted, there are ways that we can get around this. First of all, I can fit an upgraded RCD, which is the correct type. Uh, I may be able to juggle things around in the consumer unit so that we can create a spare way. Or what happens on a more regular basis is to fit a new sub consumer unit or sub distribution board, uh, which is just for the EV charger. And this is the ideal solution. Fitting a new mini consumer unit for the electric vehicle charging equipment is usually the best option. And this eradicates the need to make any improvements to your current consumer unit or the RCD within that. Finally, we'll look at the location of the charger on your property and we'll work out the best cable route for your particular installation. Now the cable for an EV charge point is normally quite big. It's a black circular cable about the diameter roughly of a 10 pence piece. And this has got to get from the sub distribution board or your consumer unit all the way around the property to where your EV charger is actually being located. One of the main variables with an EV charger installation is actually the cable route and the length of cable. So as a general rule of thumb, the longer the cable, the longer the route, the more expensive the installation will be. Well, that for the most part pretty much wraps up what the pre-installation survey is about. The next part of the process will be where I do you a written quotation um, and then you decide if you want to go ahead. OK, assuming that you've received the quote and that you're happy to proceed, then we'll move on to the next stage of the process. The next part of the process then is that I'll send you a digital survey via a text link. The survey is mainly for the OZEV grant claim and just requires some basic information to be completed regarding ownership of the car and uh, the electrical usage at your property. There's nothing difficult on there at all and most of it can just be done by taking photographs with your mobile phone and entering some information which you should know straight away. The survey will also ask for a thing called your MPAN number. 
MPAN stands for meter point access number, and this is required for the DNO notification to ask for permission to install an EV charge point. Your MPAN number can normally be found on your electricity bill or statement, and it's a 21 digit number. It's usually uh, in two rows, preceded by a large capital S, and it's actually the last 13 digits which are the most important and which I'll be looking for. Once I have all this information, I then complete a form on your behalf which is called an application to connect. This I issue to the relevant DNO or distribution network operator and they will get back to me within 10 days saying whether or not I have permission to fit the EV charge point at your property. Now this is a standard form from the ENA which is the Energy Networks Association who are the governing body for all the DNOs or distribution network operators, lots of acronyms involved here. Um, so it's the same form for all installers uh, and I complete these on a regular basis. It's relatively easy to complete, however they've made it so that it's very difficult to complete all the information. So in 99 if not 100% of all cases I have to notify the DNO before we fit the charger at your property and this process can take 10 working days, that's what they say it will take, but it can often take longer before they will get back to us and say whether we have permission to install the charger. Now in certain cases particularly if you have a loop supply and in certain other instances, you may have to have some remedial works done by the DNO. This is normally free of charge and they will contact you directly to arrange for these remedial works to be done. Sometimes it's something as simple as a fuse change. So you might have a 60 amp fuse or less and that's got to be upgraded to an 80 amp or a 100 amp fuse. This is a five minute job for the DNO. The problem is that they have to schedule that in and that could take up to a month for them to come out and change the fuse. The bigger issue would be if you've got a loop supply or there's a fault with your supply or it's not in a good condition. If that's the case, it's highly likely that you or possibly one of the neighbours is going to have to have the road dug up outside the front of your house, possibly even your driveway, and a new electricity supply from the road is going to have to be installed at your property. Now this is done free of charge, FOC, by the DNO because the, the government can't on one hand say that we've all got to uh, go to electric vehicles and on the other hand say but it's going to cost you thousands of pounds to have your supply upgraded. So this is done free of charge by the DNO. Unfortunately this doesn't happen overnight and in certain cases that I've been involved in it's, it's taken up to six months for the supply in the road to be upgraded. I think the most important thing to bear in mind here is that from the minute that you contact me and I come to do the pre-installation survey to the point where you have permission from the DNO to actually fit the charge point, that could be in the best case scenario be about three weeks, nearer four weeks normally. And if you have to have any remedial works done, for instance, if you've got a loop supply, then that could take several months. So what I would stress really is that seeing as there's a, a good few weeks or months lead time on an electric vehicle arriving once you've ordered it, is that as soon as you order your electric vehicle, then you're in a position to start organising your EV charge point to be fitted. Now I'm going to look at chargers in particular um, and the different types of connection that you can have. There are only really three types of connection. You can have a universal charger, you can have a type 1 tethered charger or a type 2 tethered charger. Now a universal charger has a type 2 socket at the charger end and you would plug a lead in which has the right connector at the other end for your car. So that could be a type one or a type two. A type one tethered charger is hardwired at the charger end, but at the car end you have a type one plug. And a type two is exactly as it says, it's hardwired at the charger end and at the car end you have a type two plug. Now to the best of my knowledge, 95% and that number's growing by the day of all UK vehicles have a type two connector at the car. So really, to all intents and purposes, most people will have a type two tethered charger. Now I'm gonna come on to power rating. Um, really, there's only two, maybe three power ratings that are worth discussing. The first one is 7.4 kilowatts or 32 amp. The next one is 3.7 kilowatts roughly or 16 amp. And the last one is what's uh, fondly referred to as a granny charger which is a three pin 13 amp plug. Now, apart from exceptional circumstances, in a domestic property, the maximum charge output power that you can have is the 32 amp or 7.4 kilowatt. You would need a three phase supply otherwise, and that is prohibitive in a normal domestic property because uh, it will cost you thousands and thousands of pounds to have a three phase supply. To put the numbers on it, um, a typical, say 300 mile 
charge on say a Tesla Model 3 or similar vehicle would take 10 hours from empty to full zero to 100 percent with the 7.4 kilowatt charger the 3.7 kilowatt charger it'd be double that time with the granny charger it'd be two and a half to three times as long in reality most people aren't charging the car from zero to 100 percent every single night you're just topping up for an hour or two so 7.4 kilowatt or even uh, 3.7 kilowatt is more than adequate for most domestic use the next thing I'm going to mention is pen protection, sometimes known as O-pen protection. Um, and this is a requirement of the Moran regulations for all chargers in the UK. Now, what is pen protection here, you say? Well, pen stands for protective earth and neutral conductor, which most suppliers in the UK have this combined conductor. Without going into great detail, if a fault develops on the pen conductor and you've got your car plugged in and charging, a dangerous situation can develop because ultimately, a car is a large metal box and if you touched it, you too would be in direct contact with the earth and you could also be wet washing that car at the same time. So bad things could potentially happen under a fault condition. Now this situation apparently happens around 500 times a year in the UK. If you're touching the car at that point, it would be a dangerous situation. So pen protection is required. Pen protection is done with a device which is normally built into the charge point. However, quite a lot of charge points don't have pen protection built in. Pen protection then has to be fitted externally by the installer and that normally costs in the region of £200 plus to fit to bring it up to the UK wiring regulations. I've already touched on RCDs and all electric vehicle charge points in the UK have to have a type A RCD and at most domestic properties you often find that the RCD on the consumer unit is actually a type AC which isn't suitable. The other thing that an EV charge point has to have is what's known as 6 milliamp RDC DD detection. RDC DD stands for residual direct current detecting device. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail, but this is another form of protection which is necessitated by the wiring regulations. And this is usually built into the charger, but it isn't in all cases. If it isn't, this can be accomplished by having a type F or a type B RCD. But again, the downside of these is that they're a lot more expensive than having the, the six milliamp DC protection built into the charger. And it's exactly for these reasons that I recommend two or three different types of uh, manufacturer and model, because I know that these charge points have got the correct six milliamp DC protection in, they've got the pen protection, and they either have the type A RCD built in, or I fit it at the front end with the sub EV distribution board, as we discussed right at the start of this video. And the final thing that I'm really going to mention about EV chargers is load management. Load management is facilitated by a thing called a CT clamp, which is a current transformer. This clamps on the main live incoming meter tail um, and monitors the load of the whole property. The CT clamp and the charger speak to each other um, and the charger knows when the incoming electricity to your house exceeds the fuse rating or 60 amps, whichever it happens to be. And this ramps back the output of the EV charge point. So ultimately, what it really means is, is that you can never blow the main fuse into your property. One thing I've perhaps forgotten to mention throughout the course of the video is that an EV charge point uh, 7.4 kilowatt model will actually pull 32 amps continuously. So that will be for up to 10 hours, as, as, as we've already discussed. So if you're pulling 32 amps continuously and you've only got a 60 amp fuse, <laughs> the charger is pulling more than 50% of the uh, entire uh, electricity supply at your property. If you're lucky enough and you've got a 100 amp fuse, it's still pulling 32% of the power at your property. So if you've got a lot of other high current devices and at the same time, for instance, washing machines, tumble dryers, granddad's got a welding set in the garage, uh, you've got an electric shower, you might have two electric showers, you've got a turkey in the oven, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if all these things are going on at the same time, then if you haven't got load management or you haven't got the highest fuse rating you possibly you can have, well, then there is the possibility that you will blow the cutout or that the incoming fuse to your property. So for that reason, I would always recommend um, a charge point which has load management built in as standard. So to wrap up the video, the process really is that you make an inquiry to me. I book an appointment with you. I come to your property. I do what's known as a pre-installation survey. We decide on the type of charge point, where it's going to go. 
Uh, I do you a formal quotation, you decide to accept that quotation or go somewhere else, obviously. If you accept that quotation, I then send you a digital survey, which helps with the completion of the OZO grant form and the other notification for the DNO. Um, I then submit the DNO notification. We wait approximately 10 or more days for, for the DNO to advise that we're allowed to fit the charge point and off we go. In exceptional circumstances, you may have to have uh, more remedial work done, for instance, a fuse upgrade, or if you've got a loop supply, a new cable laid from the road. This can take on average two to three months, but can in some cases take up to six months. So just to reiterate, you really need to be looking at getting your EV charge point installed around a month before your car is due to arrive. So hopefully you've got a better understanding now of what's involved when you go through the process of asking for an EV charge point to be fitted at your property. I hope this has been useful. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe, like, and share, uh, and keep checking back for more videos in the future regarding EV charge points and all things electrical. Uh, so my name is Gary from ABC Electric. Thanks for watching. Bye.